Been the break. Who was that that came to talk to me about children asking questions? What was your name again? Sorry. Natalie. Natalie. Um, Natalie had a really good suggestion, which I want to uh, we want to do short, uh, at some time in the future, and hopefully before the end of the year. And that is um, have an opportunity for all the children to come and ask questions of myself and Mary. And uh, we probably what we'll do is we'll probably get all the children to sit down the front or whatever. And they can. And when I say children, I don't just mean children. I also mean young adults. Anyone under the age of 18, shall we say. Um, <laughs> can come and ask, uh, sit down in front and, and ask questions of us. What we find when that happens, and I, I've done this a few times in the past actually, is they ask some amazing questions that many of you are not brave enough to ask. <coughs> so it gets to be a very interesting discussion generally. So I'm looking forward to that. Last time that happened, uh, half the parents uh, went into panic. So. <laughs> Well, they do. They, the child asks the questions, and naturally, I give them the answers that they ask, and the parents go into meltdown about some of the answers. So, <laughs> so we'll see what happens about that. But uh, it should be fun, actually, um, doing that, and uh, and and it gives a, it gives a lot of a lot of your children uh, might be watching the videos along with you and so forth, and quite often have questions that they're asking. And I know I do get quite a few emails from children at times. Uh, um, who ask me questions and I generally try to answer them back and in fact generally they get preferential treatment over you asking questions. So, uh, uh, so most of the time we find that they not only ask really good questions but they also understand the answers very rapidly because there's not that emotional blockages preventing them from absorbing the answer. So it's really interesting. I've had some really interesting questions asked um, by children in the past. So we'll do that um, probably maybe in a month's time or so even, but I'll, I'll uh, put that on the net. So thanks for that suggestion, Natalie, it's a good suggestion. All right, let's get back to our emotions. The problem with all of our emotions is that the more I can tell you about emotions, the more tempted we are to intellectualise the emotion. And this is a difficulty that we're facing at, at this time, I feel, is that a lot of the times People are wanting more information about how to access emotion and so forth, but the more information I give, the more we're tempted to go into the mind and intellectualise the process, which actually gets us out of experiencing the emotion. And so um, sometimes I look uh, at the whole situation with regard to emotions and think, is it better to say more about them or say less about them? But in the end, what we're trying to do is get you to settle underneath in the causal emotion and to do that, at the end of the day, we need to recognise what the causal emotion is and how it feels. And that's the issue that most of us face. Most of us often get into emotion, but we're not actually knowing whether this emotion is actually an emotion that's something to do with my childhood. And it is quite easy to know when something is a core emotion. So let's call it a core emotion or a causal emotion, if you like. Remember, it's your core emotions that create your law of attraction. Okay? So, your core emotions create your law of attraction. Because your core emotions are a part of your soul condition. And remember, it's your soul condition, which is the sum total of all of the the passions, desires, longings, emotions, feelings inside of your soul, the sum total of all of that, your beliefs and everything, the sum total of all that creates your soul condition. And it's your soul condition that creates your law of attraction. So if we deal with core or causal emotion, our law of attraction will change. If you have children, you'll notice your law of attraction will change the instant you connect. If you don't have children you'll find, and you have pets, you'll find your law of attraction will change the instant you connect. The truth is, your law of attraction does change the instant you connect. But unfortunately for many of us, if we don't have children or we don't have pets around us close by, we don't notice it until a few days later generally, or a week later, or when, when new events occur. So myself and Mary were driving down today, and we drove all the way down here, and it was such a smooth trip, it was unreal. And, uh, 
And I said, I must have changed a few <laughs> emotions <laughs> since the last time we drove down. Because the last time we drove down, I got stuck behind every slow person you could possibly think of between King Arroy and here. Right? And so I'd slow down, we wait, and you know what the road up there is like, you know, it's a bit windy and whatever, and there's not many passing lanes or anything, so you get stuck for a while, stuck for a while. Then you pass one, and then you get stuck for a while, stuck. That's what it was like last time, all the way. This time, all the way down, there was nobody in front of us until we came up to this semi, and the semi pulled off just as we, just in the town that we came up to him on, and then we off again, and there was no one in front of us all the way to here. Like, it was really, like, different compared to before. And I could feel some of the emotion that I dealt with that allowed that to happen. And some of this emotion I dealt with was this feeling that I had inside of myself of, oh boy, um, I can never really get things how I want them to be. You know, Nothing's ever going to run smooth. How many of you got that emotion? Like, nothing's ever going to run smooth in my life. It's never going to be exactly how I like it. There's always going to be something wrong. So, um, and I've been dealing with some of that emotion uh, a big picture type emotion for me um, over the last few weeks and so it, that's good to notice that law of attraction change. Your law of attraction is your measuring stick if you like. Now remember you can construct your life by, by constructing it with your fear barriers. The law of attraction will expose your fear barriers and I remember Josh, Josh was at our house during the week filming. He was doing some interviews with us, like what you'd call casual interviews, I suppose, which, which will probably be put on a DVD at some point. And he's asking us all sorts of questions and I'm all dressed in my ponytail and my, uh, and my bandana and, and so I look a bit different than what you see me jet normally and warts and all sort of thing. And, uh, and he interviewed us quite a lot over the last three or four days. And in one of the discussions we were talking about Josh's life, where Josh went through a period in his life where he was, he used the Zen out method, didn't you, basically? The, the power of now methods, I suppose you'd call them, that he'd been taught to actually detune from his life so much that even though the law of attraction events continued to occur, he felt completely calm and peaceful through the entire thing. So his computer would break down, completely calm and peaceful, all through, the, all through the entire thing. And these events would still occur, but he felt calm and peaceful through the entire thing. Now, is he dealing with the causal emotion? No, because the law of attraction is causing the events to still occur. The truth is the events will not occur when you deal with the emotion. You won't even have to zen out of them because they won't even happen. And that's the big difference between the natural love path and the divine love path. So use the law of attraction to show you what you're tuning out of. Now, many of us still avoid our law of attraction by creating our life to avoid it. Now, what I mean by that is, we know we've got a whole list of fears, so what do we do? We work around all of them. I'm afraid of people, so I don't go anywhere where there's people. I'm afraid to go out dancing, so I don't go out dancing. You know? I'm afraid to drive from here to Sydney by myself, so I don't drive. I always get a part, somebody to drive with me. Do you know what I mean? We do all of these things to avoid the dealing with the emotion. My suggestion is to not do that, but rather allow yourself to start accessing your core or causal emotion. Because it's only by accessing your causal emotion that you're going to get closer and closer and closer to God. Love or desire for God's love is an emotion. It can be passionately felt. But it's not going to be passionately felt if you don't feel like you've got passion about anything. You know, if you've detuned yourself from all of your passions, you can't passionately feel it. So this is why emotion is so important. Now, on, if we start with the core emotion at the base. Now, the core emotion... By the way, core emotions can be positive too. You can have positive core emotions, right? As well as ones that are harmful to you in the sense of what they generate. But here we have our core emotion. Now, the core emotion is generally covered over by lots of events. There's two types of core emotions that generally get created inside of us. One type of core emotion 
is where we become very inflective or self-reflective. In other words, we blame ourselves for everything. Now, who had a life growing up where you finished up blaming yourself for everything that went wrong? Because your parents blamed you, so you blamed you. Yeah. Uh, always consciously. Everything is conscious. No unconscious. Uh, when you say unconsciously, um, that's really just suppressed core emotion. So any time we use the word unconscious, that's emotion that we could be conscious of, but we're in denial of being conscious of. We don't want to be conscious of. Yeah. So be careful of the word unconscious, because what it does is it tends to suggest to us that we're actually not, uh, it's not under our control, but it's all under our control. You need the mic. Yeah. I guess what I meant is, um, <clears throat> like I didn't have any, any feelings that I was aware of as a child that I was to blame for anything. But yep. since processing, I've felt heaps and heaps of I'm to blame. Yep. So in relation to what you're saying... So what would happen is you had a layer of denial that was quite strong that caused you to not even be aware that yep. this other emotion was underneath you. Yep. And what I'll do here is I'll show the layers yep. and you were up in the top layer and then as you settle down into the next layers and next layers you start opening up. And so you start addressing it. Oh, I do actually have this emotion. It doesn't... A lot of people are worried because they say, oh, all you're doing is creating emotion. It was one of the questions, in fact, that Josh asked this week. And you can't create emotion... You, you can't create emotions, childhood emotions, that are already in you. Because they, were, because they were childhood already created, if that makes sense. All you can create as an emotion is an emotion that's as an adult right now. So you know when you go into anger as an adult, well, you're creating that emotion, guaranteed, right? But when it comes to a childhood emotion, if you're feeling a childhood emotion, that's an emotion that's stored already within you. You can't create it. All you can do is become aware of it. Do you follow me? There's a big difference between those two states. So you could say the core emotion is always going to be childhood generally in nature. When I say generally, it's a bit different if you're reincarnated, but, but we'll look at it from the first incarnation perspective. Core emotion is always going to be childhood in nature. So, if I'm feeling causal um, sadness, there's a high likelihood that the sadness I'm feeling will feel like I'm two years old, or feel like I'm five years old, or feel like I'm seven years old. If I'm feeling sexual shame, it will feel like I'm a little child, like maybe three years of age, feeling ashamed of its body. Does that make sense? If I'm in a causal childhood type of emotion, a core emotion. Then what happens is that our environment, through lots of different aspects, causes us to suppress a lot of this core emotion. Oh, by the way, I said there's two types. One type is, the, is this type where I'm looking intrinsically in self and blaming self. The other type is where I look extrinsically and I blame others. So our, our parents create that by doing this. Many parents now have injuries emotionally inside of their soul where they are, um, they, for example, feel controlled. And when I say feel controlled, they, they don't have very much self-worth. And in fact, many of our children have more self-worth than we have inside of ourselves, right? So what happens then is our child, as our child grows up, it knows it can manipulate our self-worth or our guilt or our shame or any of the other type of emotions that are still stored within us. It learns to manipulate us into getting what it wants. Now, the problem with that is the child learns how to break laws of love straight away through that interaction. Do you see what happens? Now, now there's, so there's two types of injuries. There's the damage that we do to our children in terms of causing them pain or suffering with regard to sadness or other types of emotions. But then there's this other side of the coin, the other damage that we do to our children, which is allowing them to get away with murder, basically. Right? Because there's this soul... It's not, it's not an intellectual thing in us. There's this soul thing going on inside of us where we allow other people to harm us. And we let ourselves be manipulated by our own children. Now, the children, our children are so sensitive emotionally, they know every single chink in your armour, trust me. They know exactly how to manipulate every single thing inside of you. 
So there's two sides of this coin. There's two sides and the two sides are the times when I'm breaking the free will of my child and then there's the times where I allow the child to break my free will. Right? Do you see the difference? And that creates two separate types of emotional injuries. One type of emotional injury is where the child blames itself for all of the things that it's doing and the other emotional injury is where the child blames its environment for everything that goes wrong. Now, you imagine we're grown up now. What do we do? Whenever something goes wrong in our life, if you're the type of person that blames yourself all the time, then you, were, you have childhood causal emotion relating to a lot of stuff where you've been hammered as a child or you've had your free will manipulated and controlled as a child and you'll need to feel a lot of grief and sadness about that. But if you're the person who, when you grow up and something goes wrong in your life, you blame everyone else but yourself, then you've got a whole separate set of emotional injuries inside of yourself where the unloving actions you take towards others need to be accessed and released inside of yourself. Do you see the difference between those two states? Mary, you want to just... I just wanted to say that in my experience, because I, I have both sets of injuries depending on the emotional set. Yes. And that was quite important for me to recognise. Yeah, so I want to just point out to you that, and that is that you may have one of these types of injuries in each place for every different emotion. So for example, I might have one set of emotions to do with sexual shame where I was blamed by my parents and so I have that that I'm to blame. But I may have another set of emotions about abundance where my parents gave me everything that I ever wanted and now I think the world owes me something. Do you see the difference? So one, on one set of emotional injuries, when it comes to my sexual shame, I'll blame myself. But on the other set of emotional injuries, when it comes to getting abundance, I want the world to provide me, so I blame the world. So we can even blame the world in one instance or ourselves in the other instance. It just depends on what happened in that particular emotion in our childhood as to what we do. That's all core emotion. Then we've got what you'd call the, the capping or blocking emotions, right? They are the emotions that were constructed inside of us that to, to help us suppress this core emotion. So you know, that when you were little, you start crying. Mum and Dad, on one hand, might do the, oh, there, there, you're all right now, you're all right now, and just get you out of your emotion like that. Does that make sense? In other words, nurture you out of feeling the emotion. That's one, that creates one set of capping emotions. See, that, what that does is it says, right, whenever I get hugged, it means I don't feel the emotion anymore. You see what I'm saying? So I become addicted to the hug, in other words. I'm feeling bad, so I get addicted to the hug. Once I get the hug, oh, I feel good. I'm right now. And a lot of people who are very needy, you can feel them, they're addicted to the hug, if you like. On the other side, they could, their parents could have yelled and screamed at us. Shut up, you! you know, and off they go, yelling and screaming at you. What does that do inside of yourself? that creates a whole separate set of emotions. Oh, some sadness comes up, I'm going to get punished. Sadness comes up, punishment emotion is going to result. And that creates a whole layer of capping emotion at the childhood level. Then, what's next? Well, what's next is the, the causal and the capping emotions, or the causal and the blocking emotions, or the core emotions and the blocking emotions, are all going to get suppressed in some way through a whole separate set of denial. Let's call it denial. <coughs> In other words, what I'm going to do is become resistive. Let's call this emotion underneath there the castle of hurt, the castle of pain, some of which is directed inwards towards ourself. In other words, a whole group of emotions where I blame myself and then some of it which is directed outwards towards everyone else. Or, in other words, a whole set of emotions that I blame other people for. Right? But the other group of emotions. And then what I do is I deny they even exist. I deny not so much even their existence, but more their experience. I deny the experience. I don't allow the experience of it. So the denial of experience. Now, the way God made us was to feel emotion. 
So God made us to naturally feel this emotion. You look at a child and a child does naturally feel an emotion. If it gets hurt, it cries. Somebody hurts it, hurts its feelings, it generally cries until it starts getting some capping emotions placed on top. And then it starts getting shut down. And so what it learns is to deny the experience of both sets of emotions. Now that's a pretty hard state to maintain. So what we then do is we create all sorts of things above that that all get placed on top of that, which is, which is a part of this castle that we build. And by the way, the more we go out here from this area, the more we're away from ourselves. In other words, we're denying ourselves more and more as we step up through, as these emotions get created. So then I start creating, all right, I've got to deny my experience. How do I deny my experience? I've got to choose mechanisms that work for me. Now, usually the mechanisms we choose are very much the mechanisms we're taught from our parents. So if you have a good look at your parents, what do they use to deny their emotion? You'll find that many of their denial tools are tools that are within you. Right? And this is a natural consequence because we're learning how to deny as we're growing up, you see? So it's a natural consequence that many of their denial tools become ours. So we construct a heap of tools of denial, right? Now, for some people, it's just a simple matter of like... And, and, and by the way, for every single emotion, it's a different tool. So let's say I'm growing up as a, as a young lady, right? I get abused as a child by my stepfather and I'm growing up now, I'm in my teens, and I start developing sexually, I start feeling my body and everything and I start feeling really uncomfortable about my body being, being a sexual shape, you know, that starts attracting sexual energy from men and, I st and that connects me to this emotion, this core emotion and capping emotion that I don't want to feel. So what I do then is I work out I need to somehow get away from my body being like this. So what can I do? Eat. Eat. Right? So I start eating. Eating, eating. And I get bigger and bigger and bigger. And of course, now, and, and the eating, by the way, is just an emotional response to the desire to get large. And so I'm, I'm there just getting larger and larger and larger because I don't want to be sexually attractive. You follow me? Now that's a tool of denial that I'm using. You follow me? That's the tool I'm using to get away from these emotions that need to be healed inside of me. And we can construct all sorts of tools in denial. We can even construct false emotions in that state. Emotions that are not even real, just in order to, to help us avoid these emotions. Right? So we can say, oh, I feel so unworthy, when in reality what we're really saying to ourselves is, I don't want to act because if I'm responsible for my actions, I'll feel bad. You know, we can, we, can cre we can create all sorts of emotions. So you could even say we could create a heap of emotions of self-deception. And we've talked about those, right? Of self-deception. So, now, what are the only emotions that are going to change our life? It's only these, isn't it? these childhood emotions. They're the only ones that if I experience, my life will change. All of this stuff, no matter how much I experience it, no matter how much I work through it, no matter how much I cry, no matter how much I feel ashamed, no matter how much I feel guilty, nothing will change. And this is the problem today with a lot of progression is people start getting into their emotions and they say, AJ, look, nothing's changing. Nothing's changing because we're not in the right emotion. We're in an emotion that we may be creating to avoid the emotion that we need to be in. Right? Now, this is all very intellectual, right? Isn't it? This doesn't help me a damn, really, does it? Really. Because at the end of the day, at the end of the day, I need to feel this and feel this. That's really where it gets down to. Now, what I've done earlier is give you a heap of tools that will help you identify these things. And it will help you identify when you're avoiding those things. But in the end, it's not going to help you experience those things. Because there's one primary belief that sits inside of most of us. 
about emotion. Do you know what that is? It's a fear, yep. I'm going to go crazy if I start this emotional process. Now, it's a false expectation appearing real to you if you believe that. In other words, it's not God's truth. God created you to experience your emotion. You are totally able to deal with every single emotion within you. Anything that comes along. Like, you can deal with the emotion of even getting murdered. You can deal with the emotion of being raped. You can deal with the emotion of being abused as a child sexually or physically or violently. You can deal with every single emotion. God created you to, deal, to be able to experience them. And there's one other thing that we need to remember. But we often feel this way instead. The belief we have often is, I am alone in this process. This is one of the worst possible things you could believe. And by the way, I'm talking to the spirits here who believe they're alone as well. It is one of the worst possible things you can believe, and it is totally untrue. Totally untrue. If you could know how many people are with you when you're experiencing an emotion, from a spirit perspective for a start, you'd be blown away. A lot of times there's 10, 20, 30, 40 people with you, with you who love you experiencing or helping you through this emotion when you're on the divine love path. And of course that doesn't even um, take into account that God is with you through the entire process. And that gets down to another core belief that really in the end there is no God. Most of us at some point feel that way when we're doing this emotional work because that is a core emotional belief we'll have to face at one point. Is there a God or not? And many of us are totally afraid of going into our emotion because firstly we believe there's no God to help me, I am totally alone and if I do this process I'm going to go nuts. And the truth is there are many times when you'll feel nuts on the process and, then I'm pro and progressing this way but you won't go nuts. You know the only way you go nuts? By not feeling your emotions. The world's asylums are full of people who are nuts because they tried to get away from their emotions. The spirit world in the lower spheres are full of people who have spent all of their life on earth and much of their life in the spirit world trying to avoid their emotions. It's the only time you're going to get harmed is by avoiding them, not by experiencing them. However, I want to say there's one proviso on that. It has to be the causal or the capping childhood emotions that you're experiencing. Because you can construct with your mind all sorts of other things which are crazy in many cases. And you can connect to spirits who are crazy, by the way, really easily. By, dealing, by not dealing with the underlying causal or capping emotions. Can you see that it's the fears, and we'll talk more about the fears next week, but it's the fears that actually cause you to stop your processing, that cause you to not be able to get to the underlying emotion. And it's the only by getting to the underlying emotion that I'm going to be able to grow. So, what I need to do is start addressing these fears. How do I address the fear of I will go crazy? There's only two ways I can address that fear. Remember, all fears are false expectations appearing real. Huh? So, how do I address this emotion? This is an emotion in me. I will go crazy. It's a belief system within me. It's not something I'm going to be able to change with my mind. Because nothing changes in the soul with your mind. Very few things, but when I say nothing, it's not probably true, because you can change in awareness, but 
the emotion has to come out of you for the real change to occur. So how do I deal with that emotion? I am going to have to feel crazy to actually release that emotion. Can you see that? I'm going to have to feel like I am nuts. Yeah. How do I have release this emotion? I'm going to have to feel like I am alone. But, what did I say when I started this little discussion? You are totally capable, you have been built to experience every single emotion. God made you that way. So in rea reality you have nothing to fear and in the end in your development when you become at one with God you'll realise actually, yeah, there is nothing to fear. You will not have a single fear within you at that point. But before then you'll have many fears to deal with. So what we're going to do over the coming weeks, over the coming week or so is we'll start giving you some practical ways in which you can start really facing your fears. And your fears are masked by so many different things. They are controlled by so many different things within you. But primarily one thing, and that is the desire to avoid emotion is created by your fear of what will happen when you hit the emotion. So the reason why we desire to avoid so much is because we're so afraid of what will happen when we connect to it. Hi, um, I felt an emotion early this week and I cut it off Yep. and then I haven't been able to get back to it and I don't know whether it's the fear of getting back because today I felt an emotion that I didn't experience when I was a little girl of a, a tragic event and it came up just like that and I've been trying to get back there but I can't so how do I get back? Okay, how many of you are having times when you start connecting to the emotion within five minutes you're out? Start connecting another moment, five minutes you're out again. Five minutes you're out again. Okay, there is fears there. There are fears there. You need to look at the fears. So when you start experiencing the emotion, so let's say you start, you start the emotion, you're starting to have the tears rolling down. Now right at this point, you can, if you're longing for God to help you through the process, you can actually keep spirits away from you by just longing to God just to nurse you through this process. You can stay in this emotion for as long as you want. There are a number of external influences and internal influences that cause you to get out. So if you start, do it for a few minutes and then it all finishes, we need to look at these particular possible causes. All right? First possible cause, I don't want to. Now, I don't want to feel this emotion. So I'm starting to feel the emotion. I don't want to. Why would I not want to? I, I've, I've come along to these seminars now for a while. I do believe in emotional work. I do understand the, you know, the relationship between soul condition, emotion, and law of attraction. I want to change my law of attraction. I feel really positive about that. And yet, why am I kicking myself back out of the emotion? Well, all I don't want to is begin with a... Fear. So at the moment that you stop crying, ask yourself, what am I afraid of? What am I afraid of? Also, when you go into I don't want to, there may be over the top of your fear some anger. So let's say you start to feel your emotion and you start crying. You might find as a part of the emotional experience this childhood anger starts raising in you, the childhood avoidance if you like. Does that make sense? And now what you're doing is you're trying to cry when in reality you should be yelling and screaming and swearing and hitting something. Does that make sense? And you need to allow yourself to do this in a fluid way. So, so this is where you need this space I was talking about at the beginning. You see, I don't want to, I lose born out of fear uh, but it may come also be covered over by anger. So, so I need to experience this anger of not wanting to feel this emotion. I need to feel it. Feel angry with God, or if that's what it's about, or angry 
with your parents that, you, that they created this emotion in you or angry at your abuser or angry at whatever but feel the anger, don't project it. There's a big difference between the two. Projecting it is going around to the person and yelling and screaming at them. Feeling it is actually sitting in your room and feeling the rage and anger that you have and owning it and feeling it as a part of the childhood experience. Now, th that is one of the reasons why we start and then stop because we don't want to. And I don't want to, in the end, is always a fear. But it may be covered by anger. The second thing is I am afraid to. In a way, in a way it's really the same as I don't want to. It's just with another la uh, uh, one less layer on it. You see, the I don't want to is a very angry place. Do, do, can you see? Like, like if you come up to me and say, AJ, can you give me a glass of water? I say, I don't want to. Right? But why would I not want to? Like if I had a glass of water with me, and why would I not want to give you one? Right? Usually there'd have to be some anger behind that, wouldn't there, of some kind. So whenever you go into I don't want to, in terms of your emotions, usually there's anger. So to deal with the anger, feel the anger of I don't want to. And then you'll step into number two, which is I'm afraid to. And afraid to could have all sorts of attachments. Why would I be afraid of crying for more than two minutes, do you think? What might be a causal emotional childhood reason? Judgment. Afraid of judgment. So whenever, you know, whenever I started crying, if I cried for longer than two minutes, Dad come along and said to me, oh, you're a wuss, aren't you? Like, Boys don't cry like you cry. Gee, I'm afraid. I'm, I'm ashamed to call you my son. You know what I mean? A few comments like that. What do you do with that when you're a child? You just go straight into, I can't cry. Cry for a few minutes. That's a, that's all I can do. Another one might be, you know, most parents let their children cry for a few minutes, but five minutes, ten minutes. Most by the time ten minutes comes up, what are most parents feeling now? are starting to connect with their own sadness, which they can't deal with and they don't want to accept. And so what do they do instead? I'll give you something to cry about. You know, they just get angry with the child and just project all this anger and rage on the child, right? So if we're crying for, for a few minutes and then getting to the point where we're not going further, it could be that we have some childhood causal emotion of, about fear of pain. So afraid of pain, physical pain, by going ahead and crying physical pain of getting punished. Can you see that? Your parents learn how to control you through many different means. Smacking was only one of them. In fact, in some ways, smacking is sometimes the least damaging in terms of some of them. Because some of the others are so hard to get rid of because they're so hard to recognise as unloving behaviour. Anybody can recognise that when you get a belt by somebody that is violent and unloving, but how do you go about dealing with something like guilt? Half the time you don't know whether it's your guilt, their guilt, whose guilt, what? Do you know what I mean? It's so confusing, right? But your parents could have used guilt. So you could be afraid because you're of getting more into your emotion because of all the guilt that might come or the shame that might come. Imagine shame. Like shame is a method many parents use to control their children from experiencing emotion. Just shame them into it. You know, like, all you have to do there is, like, your child's out with some of their friends and the parents and everything, and you tell a funny story about the child, right, about them crying or whatever else. That makes them just feel mortally shamed. They're not going to do it again, are they? There's going to be a huge amount of rage the child has towards you, and they're not going to do that same thing again to risk that. And so we could be afraid to feel the emotion because of the, of the capping emotion of shame. So whenever we stop the processing of a core emotion, it's because generally there is a childhood capping emotion there or there is a tool of denial there. And we've got to sort out which one's which. Right. Uh, you've already alluded to it, but I just wanted to point out from my own experience that the capping emotions, the fears and the childhood anger 
are really, uh, I used to beat myself up a lot because I feel like I have to do the causal but now I'm stuck in this other place until I realise that they are emotions that I do need to process as well. Yep. Yeah. Remember Can't everything jump. needs to be processed emotionally. So even if I have an emotional denial, I need to process that emotionally. Why do I, ha why do I want to choose one emotion over the other? There's an emotional reason why. So everything needs to be processed emotionally. But, but oftentimes, as Mary points out, the capping emotions we're avoiding. See, a lot of times what I notice with people when I'm talking to them is they're trying to get to the causal emotion when the capping emotion is doing this to them, right? <laughs> Hitting them right in the face. Have you noticed that? Like, um, perhaps we can give some examples during the week. During the week, we had uh, someone come and stay with us and... and I banned her from using, from using uh, uh, candles down in my eco-tent. Where's AJ with free will now? Hey, it's like... Well, she had free will. She could stay in my tent or not. Right? And, uh, and ironically for, this, for, for my friend who stayed, she... Of all the things that she loves, candles would have to be one of the things on the highest on her list. And I banned her from using them down in a tent. Like, mind you, they, they look more like a palace, I reckon, but it's a tent, right? Now, she came up the next morning in a rage with me. You know, you harming my free will, what's going on here? You know, and, and really quite upset and angry. And she said, uh, and well, she actually said she processed the anger, but when she was telling me the story, there was still quite a lot of anger coming at me, right? And, uh, and so I said, that's not a problem. And she said, no, it is a problem. You know, you're a hypocrite. And she was getting into me about how much of a hypocrite I am because I was harming her free will. I said, I'm not harming her free will. You can be here or not be here. So you can, you can go and find another tent and put a candle in that. I created this tent and so I'm allowed to ask you to not put a candle in my tent. Right? And she couldn't get that at all and I said, that's not the problem anyway. What the problem is, is that you're not grateful. I'm giving you access to this tent for free and all of my time for free and you're now projecting anger at me for controlling you having a candle. Does that sound like a causal emotion to you? Right? When we started getting into the cause of emotion, and so the, you know, she was feeling emotional at this point, but not crying very much. But feeling emotional, she was so angry with me and upset with me and everything, and saying all these things at me, all the things that I'd done that were wrong, and, and I'm a hypocrite and so forth. But underneath that was this emotion that she expected to get what she wanted, and when she didn't get what she wanted, she felt unloved. Do you see that? See, oftentimes when something's taken away from us when we we're a child, we start equating love with getting things. Or when things are given to us when we we're a child, we start equating love with getting things. So when I'm given something, oh, somebody loves me. This is where people will go with gifts a lot of times. You know Christmas time and Easter time? You try not giving someone a gift at Christmas. You see what happens then. Right? And what will often happen is this emotion will be triggered in them. That person doesn't love me anymore. They're equating love with being given something. Can you see that? That's exactly what's going on. Now, when I said just those words, she just went off and cried and for the next four hours cried. Just connecting to that emotion of feeling that love meant getting something. And if you didn't get it, then it meant that you weren't loved. And underneath that, of course, was I'm not loved unless you give me something which is a, a big causal emotion for many people, by the way. Um, now, now, before then, we were in this you harmed my free will thing. Now, whenever you do this, and this is a good secret to remember, whenever you're blaming someone else, no matter how much, you are not in your causal emotion. All right? Whenever you're blaming someone else, whenever you're angry with someone else, whenever you're frustrated with someone else, whenever you feel upset with someone else, whenever you feel hurt by someone else, you are not in your causal emotion. Because do you think the child is worried about who hurt it, not 
when you're feeling that emotion, you'll find that you'll get into this state of childlikeness when you feel an emotion. When you're in that state, now you know you're dealing with something that, ma that is causal. Does that make sense to everyone? So, if I stop crying, first thing is, I don't want to, which is an anger-based projection about dealing with the emotion. I don't want to have to deal with this emotion. I'm sick of having to deal with emotion. You know, F-A-J, telling me about emotions, like, and all that kind of stuff, right? We get really upset about dealing with emotion, right? So that's the I don't want to place. We even get angry with God in that place. Why did you make us deal with these emotions? You know, we really get frustrated. If you let yourself connect with it, you'll connect with some really big emotions. In that state, a lot of anger is covering over a lot of fear, but you need to experience it. So experience it, but understand that it's covering fear, so that will help you step down into what are you afraid of. I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to cope with this emotion. I'm afraid that if I start feeling this emotion, it will never end. It will never end and I'll be, I'll be like this, I'll be a mess. I'm afraid that somebody's going to look at me doing with this emotion and they're going to take one look at me and say, they're crazy. We just chuck them in an asylum because that's where they belong. That's what I'm afraid of. Do you know what I mean? We go through many of these emotions because we're just so afraid of what will happen when we connect emotionally. And to be frank with you, if, 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 if the majority of you saw me processing some of the emotions I've had to process, you would have put me in an asylum. Right? I wasn't harming myself or someone else, but you would have thought that it went on for too long. Trust me. There's some of my emotions that I've had to deal with that have taken like months and months and months of crying, five hours a day. That looks like depression to you, doesn't it? Yeah, it didn't feel like depression to me, but that's what you would think, and so you'd do something about that. So you see, a lot of times we're so afraid of what, how the world is going to view us doing all of these things. Mind you, um, for most of you, you will not have to process for months and months and months to deal with an emotion. Right? You've got to remember there's 2,000 years stuffed in here somewhere that have to be dealt with. Right? That's a bit different than dealing with 80, 80 years or, or less. So allow yourself to connect with the emotion. Allow yourself to experience the emotion. Allow yourself to, to say, it's okay to be a mess when I'm feeling this. You see, we become afraid to because we have all of the judgments that our parents imposed upon us in the end and our environment imposed upon us. Now, a good way to identify the fears is to see what's projected at you by others. So in other words, you start getting into the emotion and your partner says, oh, you're crying too much. What's that? That's a law of attraction event telling you what your fear is. Can you see that? If your partner's saying you're crying too much, it's because you believe maybe I'm crying too much. Does that make sense? And there's a law of attraction in that. Look at your law of attraction. If your parents ring you up and say, I'm really, really concerned about you. Why is that? Oh, because, you know, I heard that you're crying quite a lot now. Yeah. Well, that, there's a problem with that. Don't you think there's a problem with that? What are they doing? They're just reinforcing one of the beliefs they taught you at a young age that you now have inside of you. That's your law of attraction. Is that... Can you see that? There's your block, just telling you. So you see, a lot of times our law of attraction tells us exactly the block that we're, we're, that we're experiencing, that we're trying to get away from. Mary, we had one yesterday, didn't you, darling, with, with last night. You couldn't get into emotion, couldn't get into emotion, and then she just had to cry about the fact that it was too, there was too much emotion to deal with. Once she cried with that this morning, there's been three cries in this morning dealing with causal emotion and yet being blocked for a few days because just not allowing yourself to feel like it's all overwhelming. Allow yourself to feel overwhelmed. I have cried lots of times about feeling overwhelmed about how much emotion I've had to process. Does that make sense? Allow the emotion to flow. But what will happen is your law of attraction will bring to you the blocking emotion if you're not in the actual causal emotion. So even your law of attraction will tell you what kind of blocking emotion there is that you're not allowing yourself to experience. And that's a fantastic thing if you're aware of it. So, often you'll find, somebody will phone you, and you pick up the phone, they say, oh, you know, I just realised today such and such and such and such about shame and about sexual shame. Oh, yeah, okay. What do you do with that? Oh, isn't that interesting? Yeah, yeah, and have a chat about his emotion or her emotion. 
I don't, I don't do that. What I do is I think, yeah, this is law of attraction event for me. Hmm. What about this particular issue aren't I dealing with? You see? There's my blocking stuff all just in this conversation somewhere. Can you see how it, like, even your law of attraction like that works really, really easily? So, ask yourself, if you're in the anger state, if you start, start processing, if you're in the anger state, process the anger state. Don't, don't worry about trying to get to the causal emotion again. Process the reason why you stopped. Let yourself feel the reason why you stopped. And if the reason why you stopped was fear, let yourself work through your fear. Um, you want to... Shock is terror. Okay. It was shock? Yeah, it was shock. I just I shocked myself out of feeling anything. You want to shock yourself out of no, feeling... No, no, I was shocked. Like, the situation was I was in work yep. and I had actually asked God for law of attraction for um, superior... Thing. Yeah, for a and superior to treat, like to treat me like crap. Yeah. Um, basically, and my boss approached me and did the. I, I work with men. Yep. And he did the sex. Talk Sexual thing. projection at you. And then he told me to kiss his hand, and I just went red, and then nothing. And I just I wanted to feel the feeling, but I wasn't angry. I wasn't anything. I was just like now going red. Yeah. <laughs> I just felt going red, and I wanted to go home and feel that emotion. And what did you want to do? Right in that moment, you wanted to do what? With him? Just, to him? No, I, I just wanted to shut down and close my eyes. Okay, okay. So you wanted to avoid. Yeah. Okay. Why? I don't know how to act in situations like that. No, you do, actually. Okay. You're just scared to. I'm too scared see, to. I yeah, guess yeah. I am afraid. Yeah, you're scared to. You see, what was happening in this situation, by the way, many of you women need to have a listen to this one because this is something that's very common with sexual projections at you. When people sexually project at you, you will have one of two separate reactions. Usually one reaction will be either anger or rage, or the other action will be a withdrawal, like you're doing. Now, if I loved myself, what would I do in this situation? I would, if it, if it was me getting sexually projected at by a woman boss, I would say, I don't care whether you're my boss or not. The truth is that you were just sexually inappropriate with me. And the truth is that I don't deserve this. And in other words, I would stand up to this situation and state the truth. Your sexual projection is out of line. And to be frank with you, if you do it again, and I'm going to write down this incident in a diary, and I'm going to find out, if you do it again, I am going to do something about it. Do you follow me? Why didn't you do that? I froze. You were? Not in love with me. You were afraid? What were you afraid of? Um, want some help? Yes, please. What do men do when they don't get what they want? What's your belief? Oh, they get angry. Ah, so you are afraid? of a man's anger and particularly a man who's My, yeah. superior in quotation marks because there's no one who's ever superior to you but you're afraid of a man's anger because you're afraid of the power that he might have over you and so what do you do? You go into management mode. Management mode is one of two things. You either give the man a little bit of what he wants so that he doesn't do it worse. Do you follow me? So some of you will go into a flick, flick into giving him a bit of a sexual projection in return so that he doesn't get worse with you. So that, he, so that you're now, the, the control comes, if you like, back to you. That's one option. Or the other option is to withdraw, to go in within yourself rather than actually standing up for yourself. And the Law of Attraction event is saying to you, you need to have more love of yourself when it comes to your relationship with men. Now, if you had told him that the sexual projection was out of line, you would have then confronted this fear that you had. But instead what happened in this particular instance is you withdrew, which didn't confront the fear, it just reinforced the fear as valid. Can you see that? And that's why you stopped crying. 
Whenever we do something that's out of harmony with love of self, we will often then react towards ourselves in a negative way. In other words, punishing ourselves and so forth. The key is to not punish yourself. The key is to see that actually what was being triggered was your fear of a man's possible anger about not getting what he wants. And the key for you is to go into that emotionally. Does that make sense? And now you're starting to connect to some of that, right? So you let yourself connect to some of that. Excuse me. So in almost every situation that we can come up with, there's usually reasons why we do different things, right? And a lot of the reasons are to do with either fear or anger or a fear of other people's fear or a fear of other people's anger. Right? And uh, a lot of times that's what shuts us down. I've had terrible emotions to deal with about people's anger. At one stage when I was doing these talks, giving these talks for free, there would be some, there'd be some women in the audience who would go home and talk to their husbands, right? You notice most of the audience are fairly mixed, like a good mixture of men and women in most audiences. But early days there was a few more women than men in these audiences. And they would go home and tell their husbands what they were getting taught. And their husbands would ring me up, threatening to kill me if I spoke to them again. To their wives. My law of attraction, right? So I would feel all of these terrible feelings of fear about a man's potential violence towards me. And I went through lots and lots of emotions about that, working my way through those things emotionally. And my suggestion is allow yourself to deal with those emotions. Now one way you can address a fear is to actually do the opposite of what the fear dictates. So the fear dictated to you to leave the situation, right? If you do the opposite of what the fear dictated, you would have stayed in the situation and said to him, what you've done is very inappropriate. What you've done is actually out of harmony with the work policy for a start, but also it's out of harmony with the fact that I don't want your sexual projections. And when you sexually project at me like this, you are actually out of line when you're working with me. You are harming me. And I don't want you to do that anymore. And if you do it again, I'm going to do something about it. That's what you didn't want to do. Does that make sense? And, and this is what we often do with our family, our parents, our, you know, siblings, all sorts of people with whom we have emotional issues. We avoid doing something because of what the... And that's the emotion that's getting triggered. The emotion that's getting triggered is the fear that you have within you because we need to release these fears, get them out of you. Because when you get them out of you, for a start, you won't attract a man who's an angry man who's a sexual sleaze who come up with you. You won't attract that kind of man anymore because he will feel from you, oh, this person's not able to be manipulated sexually by me be being angry with her. She's just going to be more resistive. And so he won't feel the need to even project at you in most cases. And if he does, and you, say to, and you address the issue, do you think he's going to do it again? Highly unlikely. Right. On that, AJ, most of my life with that situation, I've, um, I've um, stayed there, but I've made a joke out of it. Now, is that... Is that um, so I've continued in the conversation and the dialogue, but I've always turned it into a joke. You manage the man. Yep. Right. It's, a, it's a pattern you've learnt from childhood, how to manage the man. So, so many of us do this with anger. See, see, anger is one of the most damaging emotions you could ever project in another person. It's the most, one of the most controlling emotions that you have within you. The reason why we use anger towards other people is so that we can control them and manipulate them. Now, what we learn in return often is how to manage other people's anger. And the way we manage it is by a large variety of, women, of, of things. If we're a man, it's different to if we're a woman. If you're a man, oftentimes you manage another person's anger, another man's anger, by you know, doing the he-man thing. You know? And if you're bigger than him, you can get away with that, but if you're smaller than him, you probably won't. Right? If you're a woman, man how do you manage a man's anger? You're not going to he-man him. You're not going to be able to impose yourself upon him and make him scared of you very much. So what you do is you learn a lot of other techniques. One of the techniques is to give him a sexual projection. You give him a sexual projection, he, he gets something in return, and in this high likelihood he'll be feel you can manipulate him a little through that interaction. Or joke with him. You know, turn the situation into a light-hearted situation. That 
diffuses anger in many cases and causes their mind to go somewhere else instead of what's made them angry. So that's another method we often use. We often also use, many people use sadness. Like they go into a cowering type sadness thing, hoping that that will actually trigger the person into feeling compassion or mercy. We use all sorts of things when another person is angry. The key is to look at the mechanisms we use and to, and to feel the underlying fears involved in each mechanism. So, so for a, for a, for a, and it's different in between the genders too. So, so if, if I'm a man and I'm used to angry women, when I, my mother was angry with me all my life, then I'll manage women a different way. And what I'll do is I'll always placate the woman in most cases, or I'll be more angry than they are. So I'll do one of those two things. Often, like in my case, I would placate the woman. I would make her feel comfortable so she didn't have those angry emotions and then I'd feel I can relax, you know? And so oftentimes what we're doing with all sorts of our interactions is managing the other person's unloving emotion. When you become at one with God, you no longer manage anyone's unloving emotions. You always have the goal of confronting an unloving emotion of actually exposing it. So to get between that place and the place where we are now means dealing with a lot of our fears. And to be frank, fear is the largest possible, the, the, large, the single most largest problem we face on the planet, let alone individually. It's the fear that causes the battle of your own soul. If you didn't fear anything, you'd be experiencing your emotions just like a child would, who had nothing to fear. Right? So in reality, all of your blockages to emotion are fear-based. They are all false things, false expectations appearing real. They appear real to us because they happen to us. They happen to us when we were little, so we believe they're going to keep happening. You know? So when Daddy came along and he was angry, what did we have to do with Daddy? We had to joke with him, we had to play, you know, what, what about when the schoolyard bully came along and was angry with us? What did we have to do with him? We had to do this, we had to do that. And we learn these techniques that we then carry through the rest of our life. As you release your emotions, you'll find you'll come up with all the fears that are blocking your emotion. And it's really great to be able to access them. Yeah. So in your case, the issue is managing the other person's anger through humour. Yep. Many men have this, by the way, and they use it quite well. And this is why many women love a man with a good sense of humour. Right. What do you find attractive? What do you find attractive in a man? Oh, it doesn't matter how he looks, it doesn't matter how he does this, it doesn't matter how, what character he has, it doesn't matter how much honesty he has, or how much faith he has, or how much love he has. Any of those things, it doesn't matter. What matters is he's got a good sense of humour. Right. So what's going on there? There's some avoidance and some pretty big emotion in there. And you see a lot of our, this is a trouble with a lot of our attractions, is a lot of our attractions we think of, oh, they're harmless, they're harmless, but actually they're addictions. And that brings me to that. Oh, so there. And that's the last thing I'd like to discuss today. One of the best ways to avoid your causal emotion is to get another person to fix it for you. I'll say that again. One of the best ways to avoid experiencing your own causal emotion is to get somebody else to fix it for you. So let's look at this. I feel unloved. There's a high likelihood my addiction will be to have everyone around me has to love me. Do they have to love you? No. No one around you has to love you. No one around you has to love you at all. Love is a gift. Can a gift be expected? No. So if love is a gift and a gift can't be expected, does everyone around you have to love you? 
No. But what happens if I feel unloved inside of myself and I can't love myself, in other words, I have so much self-loathing that I can't love myself, I will then become addicted to somebody else loving me. Huh? Can you see that? So my addiction becomes them loving me. All right. Now, let's say a part of that addiction is when I was young, the only time Daddy ever loved me, and I'm a lady, the only time Daddy ever loved me was when he gave me a gift. Now what's going to happen in this connection? Not only do I feel unloved when I don't get a gift, but now if a man gives me gifts all the time, I'm going to think he loves me. When in reality all he could be doing is just wanting to get into my panties. But I'm going to think he loves me. Right? Does that make sense? Because I have that emotion. So I'm feeling unloved and then on top of that have the emotion that gifts mean love and then wow, all of a sudden I have a group of addictions. So what do I find? I find a man, in this case I, that I gave, a man who gives me gifts and that's love to me. And you know what happens after two years of getting gifts? The man forgets sometimes. You know, like he's out working or whatever else and he wants to, you know, get a bit of extra cash together and he thinks, you know, and then he makes a mistake maybe of going off with his mates to the pub or something and he doesn't get the gift, you know. So he comes home and, and there's no gift. What am I feeling now? I'm feeling unloved. Is this man any good anymore? No, he's no good anymore. He, he, he give, him this, give him to somebody else. He doesn't know how to love me, right? Can you see that? So, so we can see that what happens with almost every emotion within us is we set up these addictions with other people. They, and these addictions, remember last time we talked about addictions, they're like these big tentacles. You could think of it like octopus tentacles with all these suckers on the end of them, right? Coming out of you. You know, like waiting to actually wrap somebody up in the other end of the extreme, the other end of the addiction. And, and, and eventually it connects, right? You know, and it's got you. And that's the addiction. And then the, usually the other person has the opposite addiction, of course. Does that make sense? And that's how the interaction occurs. If the other person doesn't have the opposite addiction, you get angry with them. Because, see, addictions must be satisfied. You know, we see this a lot with addictions like that are physical in nature. So, you know, like, you know, you take away a man who's addicted to alcohol and you take away his drink, what happens? He gets upset. He gets angry. He needs the drink. Right? You, you, you have a man addicted to heroin and you take away his heroin what is he, without any methadone or whatever other process there is. What happens? He gets upset. He, gets, he wants that stuff, you know, because that's the addiction. You've got to have it. And you get angry when you don't get your addictions met. You get a man who wants sex all the time and you take away his sex. What happens? Well, you'll find in a, in a few days, man, he's an angry man now, right? Which is his real nature, by the way. So, so what often is happening with our addictions is when, the key thing to remember with your addictions, if you're getting angry, it's because you're not getting an addiction met in most cases. The only case where that's not true is where you have a fear. But even then, most of the time, you're getting angry about it is still related to you not getting an addiction met. So, so addictions are a very, very good way of actually helping you access a causal emotion. A very powerful, very powerful way. So let me look, let's look at some addictions. Can you think of some addictions that a person may have? Touch. I'm addicted to touch. This is a very good one. Right? What will I do if I'm addicted to touch? And perhaps if we use the mics, because none of us get this. So what will I do if I get it, if I'm addicted to touch? Anyone? Down the front. And sorry. Um, we'll have an expectation from... I'll, so I'll now have an expectation... From those close to us, partners, etc., especially. That I'm always getting touched. That so I need children, to be touched. Yep. The children as yep, well, ready. so expectation of children 
and partner and so forth. So what will happen as soon as they don't touch me, what am I going to feel? Unloved. I'm not loved anymore. Just by them not touching me, I feel unloved. Right? Now, that's a really insidious one because that can have a lot of sexual connotations to it, can't it? Hmm? See, a lot of times women in particular swap sexual contact with touch. So I'm addicted to touch. The man, to be, when he gets touched, he gets all horny. So, so what I then do is I make a compromise. Does that make sense? The compromise being that I allow the man, I, I get involved sexually with the man in order to have that lovely, nice, nurtured, touched feeling. So I'm addicted to the touch feeling and I'll do anything for it. All addictions will do anything for. Just like the man with the, give me the drugs, give me the drugs, give me the drugs. You know, it's, it's like that. Give me the touch, give me the touch, give me the touch. It's like, and, and, and when it's happening, I'm happy. As soon as it doesn't happen, I'm very unhappy. Right? And this is something to look at with addictions because they are very powerful ways to avoid emotion, to avoid causal emotion. I'm just trying to think of some of my addictions. Uh, Sorry? Maple syrup? Maple syrup? <laughs> yeah, it's not really an addiction. I don't have it much anymore. Um, I, I I've have, lost most yeah. of my addictions and now I can't remember the ones I had. Um, I've got plenty. I used to love ice cream. I've but still got lots. <laughs> you've still got lots. You want to mention one? Um, that th the man should um, agree with me, uh, praise me in order for me to feel loved. I, if, if a man does... If a man points out a fault in me, he doesn't love me. Okay, uh, if he points out faults, yeah. And so if he praises you, he loves you. If he points out a fault, he hates you now. And you're not feeling loved anymore. Yeah. Yeah. When really, the, it's the, almost the reverse. is the love, like it, It's so far in error. Yeah, like when he points out a fault, it's just like devastating. But if I was in harmony with love, it would actually be a loving thing for my partner to point out where I was in error. Exactly. Yeah. So you can see how you can be way, way down the road of error if you do different things. Yeah? Yeah, it depends on how he does it. <laughs> depends on how he points out the faults. If he yells and screams at you, it's not very loving, obviously. But, but if you're addicted to not even having the fault pointed out to you and only the praise... And that will come from, usually that comes from, let's say I'm a woman, that will often come from our, my father only ever praising me. He just thinks the sun shines out of my bottom and, and, and he just, you know, just worships my, the grand, ground I walk on all my life. Then, of course, I'm going to be addicted to praise me. You know, that's love. It's not love, though, is it? But, but I'll feel that's love. It can be a loving act, but... It to equate one with love and one with not love, that's where the error is. That's the error. That's right. Yep. Any others? Uh, James? Um, if we might. A lot of people just crave attention of any sort. Attention. Yeah, that's a very good one, eh? Attention. You see, most of the time, the reason why we have terrible cravings for attention is because most of the time in our childhood we went completely unnoticed. Right? Lots, of, lots of us went completely unnoticed. And that was particularly the case for the older the generation, the more unnoticed we, we were probably. You know, there was this whole, remember, there was this whole thing of be seen and not heard, right? You're a child, be seen and not heard, right? So, of course you're going to crave attention. Like if somebody doesn't hear you, hear me is another addiction. Hear me, hear me, hear me, hear me. And so what happens, like... In that one, I'm starting to talk to everybody, you know. This is a time when I tell my long-winded story and half the people are not even listening because the law of attraction is already at work, right? In that the more I say, the more I open my mouth, the more they're not hearing me. They're off in some <laughs> other land, right? But they hear me. They weren't very nice. They never heard me. I don't like them. I don't get along with, you know what I mean? And that's what happens. And these are all covering childhood emotions we need to feel. So our addictions are really, really good tools to help us access underlying emotions. Any other ones that you can think of, Joy? Perhaps uh, Mike over there. I know this is mine. It's not being appreciated. Okay, being appreciated. Yep. Yeah. 
you know, you do everything and nobody ever says thank you and yeah. a bit of appreciation. Yeah, yep, okay, so you cook every night and nobody says thanks for the meal. You wash up the dishes afterwards and nobody says thanks for that. Do you know what that means too? You, you notice that with all of these, it's because we don't do it to ourselves. You see, if I don't appreciate myself, then I'm going to put myself night after night after night after night in a situation where nobody else appreciates me either. But see, if I appreciated myself, I wouldn't do that. Can you see that? See, most of our addictions are born from the fact that it's not within me already. So if I have an addiction, praise me, praise me, praise me, it means that I don't think I'm praiseworthy. It means that I don't think I'm really any good and I need you to tell me I'm good so that I feel good about myself. The same goes with attention. If I need your attention, it means that I don't take any notice of myself. I'm not, I don't feel like I'm worthy within myself to have attention being given to me. And so I want you to do it for me. Does that make sense? Well, if we go to Ray with the mic there and then to... On the line of attention, there's a negative attention. Negative well, behaviour. Being an addicted to negative attention? Addicted to negative Certainly. attention. Certainly. Well, you can see how that addiction occurred. Hey, when you were little, the only attention you got was when you got a belting or you got in trouble. So after a while, what happens is you're seeking trouble. So you, go, you become, if you're the man, you become the trouble, you know, the troubled man, the troubled teenager, the troubled adult, and you're just always in trouble. And really, in the end, all you're doing is seeking love through the trouble, but you're addicted to it, and you don't know how to let that go. Cool. I was just going to say that things that aren't, lots of things that aren't negative in themselves can be addictions too, like reading and exercise. True, yep. So reading and exercise. I'm more talking about emotions here, but that's very true. There are things like, there are actual activities that we can become addicted to as well. The, t the test to see whether you're addicted to anything is, do you get angry when it's taken away from you? Or anxious or fearful when it's taken away from you? Because there's a good indication that it's an addiction. If we go out the back and then down to Karen. You're just here, just here too, thanks. Uh, you can. AJ, I was hoping you could tell me what the underlying emotion is to needing to be right all the time. So, need to be right? What do you think it might be? Exactly. It's all, with almost all emotional addictions, it's the opposite emotion that we're avoiding. Right? You can see, praise me, I'm avoiding that I'm not praiseworthy. Being appreciated, I'm avoiding the fact that I'm unappreciated. Wanting attention, I got none. You know, you can see the, can you see the pattern? There's always the flip side. What we're doing with addictions is we want the other person, the other person to actually fulfill something within myself that I am not already fulfilling within myself. Or that I don't feel God can fulfill within myself. So what I'm doing is when I say, praise me, praise me, praise me, please praise me, I'm actually saying to everyone else, you've got to praise me because I can't praise myself. I can't feel good about myself unless I receive your praise. Right? And it, with, it's the same with all of these addictions. Now, the secret is, whenever you feel angry, so whenever you feel angry or rage, it is usually because you are avoiding the fact that whatever it is you're angry about is an addiction that you're not getting satisfied. And what you're doing is you're projecting it onto, as an expectation to people around you. Do you follow that? And if you look at addictions, it's a really powerful way to, to really hone in on some, power, on some causal emotion. Because addictions are so simple to access a causal emotion. Because it's always the opposite of what you're addicted to that you're avoiding within yourself. So it's really simple. Does, when you say whenever you're feeling anger or rage, yep. is that and it, that's likely to be an addiction, you're not getting satisfied. Are you talking then also about the slight annoyances, the little... Yep, just slight annoyances, that? right down into the little smidge of annoyance. Yeah, right? All of that. So annoyance, I'm annoyed, I'm frustrated. Right? All of that is all part of the addiction, all part of the addiction. So allow yourself to see them as addictive behaviours. When you connect with that, you can do some really powerful things with your emotional work. Uh, 
AJ, what's workaholism? What, what is it? It's an addiction to be busy. So yes. Yes. Why, do I, why am I addicted to be busy? Yes. Why do you think you would be addicted to be busy? So you don't have to feel. Yeah. Yeah. You don't have to stop and feel yourself. I was addicted to be busy, <laughs> trust me. I was, like four, I was running four companies. Man, I was just like addicted to be busy. Uh, a microphone, thanks. Isn't that the same as what Paula was saying? With doesn't matter what our addiction is; it's a distraction. Um, yeah, here emotion. I'm talking about emotional addictions. Yes. Whereas Paula raised the issue of actually physical addictions. And is that the same as workaholic? Workaholic is a physical addiction. Yeah, which covers an emotional addiction. Does that make sense? So all physical addictions do is cover emotional addictions. The key is to hone in on the emotional addiction. When you hone in on the emotional addiction, the flip side of the addiction is the emotion you're avoiding. So it's quite simple then to access the emotions. And, yeah. Sorry, I got lots of them today. What about time? And it swells, as in I want to give people so much time and then I don't want the time back. So you're, you're giving away your time all the time? Well, when I, when I spend time with people, I, want, I give them all the attention, I give them all this time, but then I go through periods where I can't have that back at all. Where you can't or you... I can't, I don't want it. You I, don't accept like, it back. No, 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 I just want my own time. Leave me alone. Like it's the, the addiction of wanting to give time and the addiction of not wanting any time. Yeah. So it's... Um, so what do you think is happening? Oh yeah, exhaustion. So I what happens is you're given, 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 given until you're exhausted. Yeah. And then you say, oh, I've got to stop now. I just need my own time. Please don't anybody demand anything of me now. Okay, but what's the addiction? Like if time is my addiction, then what's the opposite? Yeah. Like now we're talking about a physical addiction oh. and it's very similar to the workaholism that Sven brought up. Okay, thanks. Sorry. Or a desire to be loved. Yeah, well, in the end, all of them are desired to be loved, noticed, or whatever. Like, I was addicted to be a workaholic so that people, so that, so that I could feel good about myself. So I, I never created enough, is what I felt. So what I did was I just worked and worked and worked myself into the ground in order to create enough so that I could just feel good about myself. It didn't matter what anybody else said to me. They all, you know, people were saying, oh, that's amazing what you're doing. I don't know how you get the time and all that. And I didn't notice any of that. All I noticed was I wasn't doing enough yet because I wasn't happy with how much I had achieved yet. And so I had a lot of judgments about that. So physical addictions are always covering over emotional addictions. And my emotional addiction was Unless I was a super achiever, I couldn't feel good about myself. So my addiction was, I want to feel good about myself through what I achieved. Right? The flip side is what I needed to feel. I can't achieve anything that's of any worth, which is what I've had to feel. So it's always the flip side that in the end that you need to feel. Um, AJ, can you be addicted to truth? Um, it's a wonderful addiction. Uh, <laughs> Um, you can certainly, in, in a negative sense, you're asking, can you be addicted to truth in a negative sense? Yeah, can there be um, yeah, negative aspects to it? I don't feel so. If you're talking about God's truth, I don't feel so. Yep. Yeah. Well, I'm what addicted. about man's truth? Um, well, man's truth is very different to God's truth. And if you're addicted to man's truth, it can become a, a nightmare. Usually the reason why we're addicted to man's truth is because we have a deep feeling within us that we're not intelligent enough, we don't know enough. Does that make sense? We want to, and we only feel good when we know more. So if we're addicted to man's truth, it's usually because of those kind of emotions. A God, being addicted to God's truth um, is, a, is a really good thing to do. It's to really have a strong desire for God's truth. And when you say addiction to God's truth, the key, when you're addicted to God's truth, if we use the term addiction, you won't ever get angry, right, about not having it. So, so if you're getting angry about not having it, then there's another emotional addiction, and it's certainly not to God's truth, it's for something else. And so, 
that slot sort of like tied into honesty? Um, addiction to honesty? Well, if we're expecting honesty from others, then we're addicted to honesty for, for personal reasons, and we need to look at that, certainly. Because in the end, I cannot expect honesty from you, because honesty is a gift of love that you would give me. Right? But I can't expect it. And as soon as I expect it, I'm out of harmony with love myself. So I need to look at that inside of myself. Why am I addicted to honesty and how do I react? Now, usually with all addictions, remember the sign of an addiction is that we get angry, annoyed, frustrated if it doesn't happen. So look at anything that makes you angry, annoyed, frustrated if it doesn't happen. Look at those addictions. Now, uh, it's uh, already 5.30, so we need to finish. Um, I'd like to... Th uh, tomorrow, by the way, is a spirit uh, mediumship and healing stuff. Tomorrow will be a little different in that we'll be giving you some examples of different things that have happened to different people with mediumship and healing during the week. And, uh, and uh, it's been a really, really fun time to, to expose some different things. And we, what we want to do is talk to you about some of these different things. So that'll be tomorrow, along with some homework about fear. And then remember the next week will be about the fear discussion and then I'll be purposefully going for the jugular of your fears, right, uh, on the Sunday. So that's something to look forward to if you're brave enough to come along. And thank you very much for your time again today, guys. <laughs>